the next panel will again be uh, Secretary Rice uh, talking about North American energy. And uh, with Secretary Rice, we have uh, Peter McKay from Baker McKinsey in Canada and Jaime Parada with the Institute of Innovation and Technology Transfer in Nuevo Leon, Mexico. Well, good afternoon, gentlemen. And uh, good afternoon. we've just had an opportunity to talk about uh, the region of the world that I think for the last 70 or 75 years, if you had said energy, people would have said the Middle East and they would have said Saudi Arabia. They would not necessarily have said North America. But now, uh, if there is a development that is really, in, in many ways, uh, a revolutionary development in uh, energy, it is the coming on board of the North American platform that stretches from Canada down through the United States and into Mexico. And so this is really an extraordinary time to talk about the opportunities uh, that North America presents. Now, I mentioned with the ambassador that when I was Secretary of State, oil spiked at $145 a barrel. Uh, nothing warps diplomacy like $145 a barrel oil. It allowed Iran to ignore calls for dismantling its nuclear uh, program. It allowed Vladimir Putin to play games with Ukraine and Eastern Europe and indeed Western Europe with the so-called oil card. And it allowed Hugo Chavez to buy elections in uh, many Latin American countries. Uh, so it really empowered some of the worst actors in international politics. Everybody now says, oh, how amazing it will be that North America, this stable place of good friends, will be uh, such a major energy producer, as a matter of fact, the energy producer. Um, are we right to be encouraged and optimistic by the fact that we have this bounty that's called the North American Energy Platform? Were Peter, do you want to start? I just have to mention, uh, <laughs> Peter McKay uh, was the Foreign Minister of Canada when I was Secretary of State, but he's also been the Justice Minister and the Defense Minister, and so he held almost every important job in Canada. But uh, we were very good friends, and Peter, welcome to Stanford, where I've been trying to get you to visit for a very long time. Well, thank you so much, Secretary Rice. <laughs> thank you. I, I'm delighted to be here, and it, it truly does feel like Stanford University, this forum is the, the beating heart of energy innovation in, in North America, if not the world. Uh, to your question, those who, who think this is our time and uh, the North American energy sector in particular is hitting its stride, that's true. Have you followed the NAFTA negotiations? <laughs> um, well, at least we still have we do. a North American integrated. We do, and, and I think that, in fact, there's lessons to be learned. I, I believe that there is tremendous strength in the relationship in North America, and, and that could extend beyond, and should extend beyond the Canada-US-Mexico trade agreement. It, it could extend to security, and in fact, it should mm -hmm. extend to energy mm -hmm. and renewables. Mm -hmm. And our effort to wean ourselves off, quite frankly, some of those countries that you've mentioned, who intermingle geopolitics and malignant influence in the world by, by virtue of having countries who are dependent upon them for energy. And so there are a number of, of competing and important uh, issues that are, are inextricable, is what I would say. Um, I, I don't take issue with what the ambassador of Saudi Arabia was saying, but Russia, uh, look, Russia, you alluded to, used their influence in an, in an extremely negative and destabilizing way, very disruptive. Uh, for not just Ukraine, but for the entire region, and, and, and still to this day. I mean, the late, great John McCain referred to it as a mafia-run gas station masquerading as a country. I mean, those are harsh words, but mm -hmm. they're, they're, there's, there's some truth in it. Yes. And uh, coming back to North America, I, I think we have a tremendous opportunity at this moment in time with shale gas, with uh, perhaps working closer together. Canada has always seen itself, and, and I say this with great respect to Mexico, as your best friend. We're, we're your best friend. We're your northern neighbor. It's very cold up there. We need energy. We're all huddling along the border, you know, <laughs> just hugging each other. But we have an opportunity, I think, to work a lot closer rather than being competitors, which is kind of where we're headed mm -hmm. at this moment in time. 
And so I'm hopeful with the successful conclusion of the negotiations around trade that we can perhaps work closer together on a number of these technological advances in renewable energy, but also using our, our energy power for a force for good in the world. Mm -hmm. Good. Mr. Yes, I, I'm totally agree with you. And uh, on the Mexican side, I, I would say that in the last uh, five years, Mexico uh, had achieved an important uh, progress in the energy sector. In 2013, was approved a new law for energy that permits uh, private investment in oil, gas, and electricity. And that was a huge transformation in the country. Uh, because you remember that our national companies, Pemex and CFE, were monopolies. So, the country uh, took a very important step forward to permit the private investment in this sector. And this is vital because Mexico is the second largest uh, Latin American economy, is ranking in number 16 in GDP in the world. We have 123 million inhabitants in population we have close to 50 million electricity users. We have 98% of coverage of electricity. So almost all the people has access to electricity. Uh, with the exception of the poor regions and distant areas. And uh, the installed capacity of Mexico is 73 gigawatts, and 23% of that belongs to clean energies. Mexico has signed an agreement to reach at least 35% uh, for clean energies in 2024. And uh, we have a serious commitment uh, with clean and renewable energies. We have a serious commitment uh, for the reducing uh, greenhouse uh, emissions. Uh, Mexico has signed the Paris Protocol, as you know perfectly well. So uh, Mexico is well prepared for the future, but especially uh, for the region, because we are very dependent. Mexico imports important amounts of gasoline, mm -hmm. natural gas. So the, the objective is how can we work together in order to provide the best conditions for our users in the best terms? Mm -hmm. uh, thinking not just in North America, but uh, also in the world, in the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, so th this is the in my view, the last uh, important achievement uh, of this government. Yes. Uh, going just to that, and then, Peter, I'd like to come to you about the politics in Canada, because I, I mentioned that we think of the politics of North America as settled, as stable. Um, I think it's fair to say that they feel a little less settled these days, uh, maybe all the way from Canada to Mexico, of course not in the United States, but uh, uh, in any case, um, the politics of Mexico recently taken a very, potentially very big turn with the, uh, the election of um, Manuel um, Opez Labrador. And um, as you mentioned, Mexico made a really fundamental decision a few years ago under uh, President Peña to change the constitution so that there could be foreign investment mm. in what had been considered Mexico's uh, prize, uh, prize energy that could never be shared with, with anyone else. There are many who wonder now if given the politics of Lopez Obrador, he would try to undo the change in uh, Mexico's uh, laws concerning Mm. private investment. Now, he said that he would honor current contracts. I understand that. Mm -hmm. But in the long run, how does this, how does this look? 
Well, if we are seeing the, the numbers uh, as a consequence of this uh, energy reform in Mexico, we have to take in account that uh, we have achieved at least 254 billion US investments in the energy sector. One third in oil, one third in gas, and one third in electricity. 100 billion additionally for the oncoming years. And uh, those contracts were provided to 130 different companies. Uh, from 19 different countries. 51 are Mexican companies. So as you can see, based on facts and numbers, the energy reform brought investment, employment, and Mexico requires additional energy to sustain the growth. So there are some concerns about if the energy reform will continue in these terms or not. Uh, I am a positive guy that thinks that the energy reform will be respected as it is. Not is the case about other structural reforms like the education. Education, I'm not so feel so optimistic. They will make important changes, especially in the evaluation process for professors. Because for political reasons, the unions of professors in Mexico are very strong. So that the structural reform will be affected, in my opinion. But in the energy sector, we have two important allies, Canada and US. And you know, this is the check and balance, very, very important. And also, uh, will transmit a negative sign mm -hmm. for foreign investment if we don't respect the contracts and obligations that Mexico has subscribed to them. Yes, thank you. So, uh, Peter, talk about the politics of Canada at this point, and in particular, several in the audience have raised the question of the carbon tax, and uh, whether, in fact, this is now Canada taking leadership uh, in North America, indeed, maybe in the world, in terms of uh, a carbon tax. But how do you think about uh, the, the, the fact that there is a carbon tax, but also the sort of pull and tug between the provinces on this issue, Alberta, for instance, with the tar sands, uh, very concerned. How should we think about the political situation in Canada around this carbon tax? So it's a very, it might surprise you to say that it's a very volatile time. Okay. Uh, we're in the perpetual election cycle that every country seems to be in, but we'll be in a, an earnest election cycle starting in the new year. And I suspect that energy will figure very prominently in the run up to and even the outcome of the next election, carbon tax, which I'll address in a moment, but also pipelines. And the politics of pipelines have become very divisive in Canada uh, and very difficult to reconcile uh, in part because of our, our relationship with our First Nations, our Aboriginal people. The courts have intervened on a number of occasions to stop pipeline development. Provinces have launched lawsuits, British Columbia in this instance, uh, to block uh, the development of a pipeline. And we saw for the first time since Petro-Canada, which was a, a government-run uh, gas company, the purchase, so the, the nationalization of a pipeline uh, when our current government invested in and, and paid um, an exorbitant amount of money, billions, for a pipeline that probably won't be built. So in the run-up to the election, these are going to be very contentious issues. To come back to carbon tax, yes, I think Canada is projecting leadership on this issue, but again, not without causing a great deal of internal consternation with our provinces. And it's a jurisdictional issue that they're fighting over. The federal government wants to impose a price on carbon. The provinces who will be uh, tasked with implementing and, and basically policing. Uh, and it's, it's a tax on everything, which is never popular. 
Um, it'll affect disproportionately rural parts of our country, of which there is massive uh, amounts of territory that will be affected. And the problem is, is this. Canada, I would contend, has a very low manufacturing footprint to begin with, a relatively small population vis-a-vis -vis Mexico and the United States and others. And with our forestry, we are really a carbon sink. We are not a major emitter, you know, relative, again, to other economies. If you look at, if you compare us to China, Russia, India, Pakistan, other countries who may or may not have signed on to Paris Accords, Kyoto, but they're not doing it, and they're not going to reach their targets. And so the debate becomes oversimplified. If Canada is going to hobble our industry and our population by imposing a carbon tax, and other countries are not going to do it, we're whistling past the graveyard. We're really not having the impact. We, we may be able to say at UN meetings and otherwise climate change accords you know, look at the world Boy Scouts that we've become, but it's not gonna impact unless everybody participates, and therein is the, the problem. One last point I wanna register. I, I heard the president of Stanford this morning in his opening reference the Arctic. You and I have had discussions about yes. the Arctic waters, contentious areas, even, even boundary disputes in the Beaufort Sea, the internal waters of Canada, the, the Northwest Passage. Uh, the change is happening. I mean, this is beyond any debate now. I went there when I was 17 years old on supply ships, spent summers in the Arctic as a student 25, 30 years ago. And to go back today, as we did on, on Arctic maneuvers with our military, these now, these small ports are wide open where they used to be packed with ice. The maps that you see today, satellite images, show the incredible, incredible mounting, melting of ice that's happening both on land and sea. And you're gonna see increased traffic. We're already seeing increased traffic because it opens up waterways. There's a, a arguably a fourth ocean now around North America. The Chinese, the Russians in particular, and others are, are interested in our resources and they're interested in having a presence there. So it has a, very much a security element to it. So again, I come back to the need for cooperation. We do it through NORAD, uh, we do it through other international security forums like NATO, but I think there is again an impetus in North America for Canada and Mexico and the United States to really pull together when it comes to the subject of climate change, when it comes to the subject of energy and energy security. Yes, yes. in fact, uh, what's happening in the Arctic, both in terms of the competition and the, the melting, which is, it says that uh, we'd better get busy quickly about the issue of environmental sustainability. And one of the one of the challenges for any government is to find a balance between economic growth, energy mix, and environmental concerns. And so you mentioned the Mexican commitment to uh, it was 34, 35% uh, reliable, reliance on uh, renewables. Uh, how does Mexico plan to get there? Um, and what are the steps that are being taken? How is this something that can be helped through cooperation with Canada and the United States. I often thought that one of the problems with NAFTA and the new negotiations on NAFTA and what has come out of it, the US-Mexico-Canada uh, relation, uh, Mexico-Canada Treaty, is that actually we were going back over old ground. We didn't really, we, Peter, you and I used to deal with uh, dairy price supports in Canada and apparently dairy price supports are still at the center of uh, US-Canada discussions when perhaps we could have used this time to have the region be more uh, sustainable and uh, more influential on things like the sharing of technologies. Some have suggested that uh, environmentally important technologies ought to be tariff free. Uh, this would have been a chance to try that. So how are we gonna get there and can you start with talking about how Mexico might get there? Mm. Yes, it's a very good question. In, in the last five years, Mexico uh, has passed from 150 megawatts in solar energy to 5,000 megawatts in solar energy. Uh, that represents more or less 5 billion US dollars of investment. 
we have to take into account that Mexico is a, is a very sunny country. 85% of our territory is sunny. We have five kilowatt per square meter per day. So in that respect, the, the forecast that the, the Ministry of Energy has made for the future, I mean, talking about the potentiality for solar energy and other clean energies, represents a potentiality of 6,000 gigawatts. That represents 35 times of our present installed capacity of Mexico. So the opportunity is huge. And uh, Mexico is providing tax incentives for the investments associated with clean energy. Uh, of that figure, 6,000 gigawatts of potential application for clean energy, 75 represent for solar, and I would say 20% 20, 20 for wind in a very selected areas of the country. Uh, so the opportunity is there. The, the government attitude in terms to provide tax incentives is there. So the big question is the cost of the solar panels is one uh, real uh, challenge. And the other challenge is the cost of the natural gas, you know? Because uh, we need to, to create a sustainable business to generate electricity in a very solid uh, foundations. In that respect, probably Mexico, Canada, and US can provide the necessary framework in terms of financing, in terms of uh, prices, in terms of installed capacity for producing high efficient solar panels, and so on. So it's a very, in my opinion, it's a very integrated and systematic approach that we have to take in account in order to take the advantage that Mexico could offer for the region. Yes, and in fact, um, you, uh, one of the questions here is, do you think that the new government, AMLO, will continue these policies? And it sounds as if you think this is, these, renewal, these target renewables is going to, that's gonna stay in place. Yes, uh, I, I, I think that the, the next government that will take place uh, the first day of December this year, will take seriously the, the, the take care of the environment. We have a very solid uh, legal framework for control the environment. Uh, Mexico has developed a good attitude uh, to control our natural resources. So it's a tradition not uh, that comes from this last government, comes from several gov governments ago. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So my forecast is that uh, the next government leading by Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador will continue with this path. Yes. No? Yeah. Uh, so uh, the vital ingredient, ingredient is that we have we are, we are going to sign the final agreement between Mexico, Canada, and US, no? So this is a very, very important step forward. Facilitate the next action plan for the energy sector. And Peter, I hear there's a question from the audience about why you keep talking about pipelines, which are dirty, rather than uh, focusing on renewables, and Canada is actually been quite a leader to the degree that you can, uh, some of the geographical limitations for Canada on certain kinds of renewables, but do you want to talk a little bit about this? Yeah, sure. I mean, the reason pipelines are important to us is uh, we're now discounting our oil at about $50 a barrel, sending it to the United States. 97% of oil in Canada, oil and gas, goes to the United States. We don't have diversity in our market. We can't get it to Tidewater. And uh, I, I alluded to some of those problems earlier. So that's, that's a big issue. That costs the Canadian economy about $16 billion annually, the fact that we discount our oil and send it to the U.S. So, you know, there's regions in Atlantic Canada, for example, where I'm from, 
where we import oil. We buy it from who? Saudi Arabia, Algeria, and Venezuela. And then we hector them about their human rights and we, we complain about uh, military contracts, but we buy their oil. So it has an, it, it, there's an issue of independence and sovereignty. The United States is doing the opposite. You're, you're becoming more energy independent to the point where you won't be importing any oil at the current rate. And you're up to, uh, I think it's around 10 million barrels a day. So, you know, diversity within the industry is one thing. We need diversity within our entire economy in terms of our supply and, and the supply chain. That also, um, I should say, doesn't take away from the fact that we're, we're moving into renewables, we're moving quick, you know, solar. We don't have the same amount of sun as Mexico, but we have water. We have some of the biggest hydroelectric generation plants in North America, and they're getting bigger. Newfoundland and Labrador is, is completing a project, what, what's called the Lower Churchill Falls, or Muskrat Falls, that could literally light up the whole eastern seaboard of the United States uh, when it comes online. We, we still use nuclear. We are one of the world's biggest producers of uranium. We are moving in the area, quite innovate, innovative, in the area of wave technology. We have some of the highest tides in the world. And so water is part of our solution. And water, is, as I mentioned, is contentious. I remember we had some discussions around Passamaquoddy Bay and some of these very... Uh, I, I used to just... I, I often said that when we were going to... We had a U.S.-Mexico-Canada forum for all issues, and it felt like a homeowners association because we were always talking about issues like water um, and, uh, and treaties for water made many, many centuries ago. So... One of the most undiplomatic things I ever did, and I got chastised by my own department, was one of your first visits to Ottawa. I got up from the table and I walked around to the other side and put a map in front of you and started pointing to things. And the officials were horrified that I would do this. <laughs> Anyhow, it didn't. It didn't seem to to affect the relationship. We're I, we're okay. I, I, no, no, it, I'd seen the map. It's okay. <laughs> I, I thought you did. But I, I think that uh, the, the whole subject of how the countries have integrated on trade, on economy, on energy, bodes well for us in, in the, the broader sense. This university, to my astonishment, has invested in energy projects in Canada substantially, uh, which I think, again, helps with the understanding of the North American responsibility that we all share. I think we can do more on things like tailpipe emissions. I think we can do more in the area that we have in the past around emissions generally uh, with new technology. The Acid Rain Treaty was a shining moment in the relationship between Canada and the United States, uh, going back to the Reagan administration where they worked very closely to address these issues because you know, we have borders at the, the 49th parallel and between Mexico and Canada. But pollution doesn't stop at these borders. These are not smoke-free silos that we live in. So that is an energized generation behind us to address those problems. And uh, I, I, for one, think we're going to get there. I think we will find ways. The carbon tax is not the be-all and end-all uh, because you're, some have called it a price on pollution, but it's, it's a license to pollute is another way to look at it. Yeah. And unless everybody's in, it doesn't work. So there's also a, a question about nuclear cooperation uh, with the United States, because Canada has continued to be all in on the nuclear side. The United States uh, is on and off on, uh, on the nuclear side, but that might be an area for cooperation as well? I believe so. I think uh, we've certainly advanced in our understanding of nuclear technology, nuclear energy. Um, I know it's contentious in, in the mind of, of many, uh, rightly so, what we've seen happen in places like North Korea uh, and Iran are reasons for concern because it's taken from, from a domestic purpose to weaponize it. Uh, but it's there. It's, it's at our disposal. We know that it has a much, when, when used properly, has a much more positive impact on the environment mm -hmm. than fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. But we're not going to be off fossil fuels. I mean, that's a hard reality, but we're not going to wean ourselves off fossil fuels for decades. Uh, we can accelerate it in certain ways, and the way to accelerate it is, in my view, to share technologies with like-minded countries, democracies predominantly. Right. Uh, let me ask you about the view from the north and the view from the south of the middle. Um, <laughs> 
how should we think these days about how the uh, United States is thought of in terms of some of the issues that we've been talking about? Uh, energy, renewables, climate change. Uh, there's a question here that asks me about the Paris Agreement, but let's start it as a conversation. If you're looking from the north, you're looking from the south, what do you see uh, in the United States on, on these issues? Wow, please. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mexico's first in the named agreement with the United okay. States, so it uh, makes sense. Uh, it's brought up. Okay, well, well uh, in, in, in my view, we need a 25-year plan, a very well-integrated 25-year plan, because it's the, the limit time that the, this humankind has to reduce this negative effect of uh, gas emissions. So uh, it's a very complex uh, problem that needs to take care of many, many aspects. Uh, one is infrastructure. Because when we are talking about uh, clean energies, the, the first hurdle, the first tackle that we need to remove is transmission lines. Mm. That means infrastructure. When we are talking about natural gas, we are talking about pipelines. So infrastructure means a very, very important uh, capital expenditure issue that we must solve together because uh, that represents a huge investment. The second point, in my opinion, is uh, how, how can we design the appropriate conditions for the three countries to encourage, to facilitate, and to provide the necessary tax incentives for clean energy investment. And the third point, in my opinion, is the regulatory aspect. I'm talking about prices. Because uh, all the time, the clean energy uh, alternatives uh, is uh, fighting against the natural gas prices and the oil prices. So we need to define some uh, clever strategy to deal with that aspect. Because if, if we leave all this, uh, the final solution for the market never, never will happen, mm. never. So we need to, uh, to make an agreement among these three countries to think jointly, uh, not just in, in terms of the marketplace and the benefits and the returns, but as a whole integrated strategy that takes care of the environment and the cheap access to energy for everyone. Excellent. Peter? I, I try to take a positive view of, of what's happening, and uh, it's alarming sometimes. We have institutions that are being challenged. We, we have agreements that are being rewritten. And that's fine. I think you, know, you made a very good point that modernizing um, age-old agreements and institutions is actually not a bad thing if it's, done, if it's done properly and if people do so with the best interests of everyone in heart. Um, there's such a history between our countries that goes back militarily, that goes back uh, throughout our, our entire history that can't be ignored, you know, other than that little dust up in 1812 and the White House and all of that. But that was the Brits, it wasn't us. Yeah, it wasn't you, that's right, yes. Uh, sort of. Uh, sort of. <laughs> well, you know, they're, they're paying for it now with Brexit. Yeah. <laughs> they're, uh, they have their own problems. I mean, that, that to me is another example of a country that you know, while they're, they're going through this unscrambling of the egg in uh, the European Union, we should be doing more mm -hmm. with Great Britain. It's a natural extension in North America to loop in the British. And they, they are doing a lot of uh, interesting and innovative things in energy as well. I mentioned wave technology. They, like Canada, US, Mexico, have offshore platforms. Um, the oil sands have been mentioned a number of times. 
There is remarkable technology that gets overlooked at what's happening in the oil sands. It, it is not this major, dark, you know, hellish spot in North America. It's actually when you see it uh, with your own eyes, it's remarkable how they leave the ground after the bitumen has been extracted. So they, they are using, rightly so, highly regulated, important technological advances mm -hmm. to do proper extraction. Um, pipelines have been referenced time and time again, but look, this is about an economy uh, that we can help produce competition uh, away from some of those countries. Instead of using sanctions, for example, against Iran and Russia, if we can sell them clean North American oil and gas, put it on tankers, and send it to their ports, I mean, what greater way to defang Vladimir Putin than to be able to offer clean, renewable, and, and uh, energy that has been produced in North America at a competitive price? Uh, so those are things that, again, we should be looking to work together on to find a way a North American energy solution, I think, is very important at this moment in time. And we're never going to be able to get away from the geopolitics of all of this. It's so important to the world economy. We're never going to be able to put it off to one side or remove the politics entirely from it. That, that to me, is impossible and, and can't really be part of the solution. The problem is, in some cases, the, the lack of continuity when governments do change. That's why international treaties, international climate accord, international agreements have to be respected and have to stay in place regardless of the turnover uh, that happens quite rapidly in governments in North America. Yeah. Well, I mean, the Paris Agreement is uh, referenced here, and obviously the United States withdrew from the Paris Agreement. Uh, the, the good thing about the Paris Agreement was it was really unlike the Kyoto Accords, which I think had created uh, targets that no one was going to meet. Unrealist. As a matter of fact, only two countries met them, uh, little Croatia and Germany, and Germany because it shut down the, power, the dirty plants in East Germany and met its targets that way. So uh, having these sort of artificial targets, but, but Paris had a different approach, which was to have each country come up with an answer to the three E's, economic growth, environmental sustainability, and energy mix, and then to sort of aggregate that up into uh, an international treaty. I think, thought it was actually a very smart way to go about it, but the United States is currently out. I think we need to remember that the United States, um, an awful lot of environmental policy in the United States is actually not federal. It's actually at the state level, and we're probably going to have a test here soon of whether a state like California can have its own emission standards. Uh, so American institutions are struggling with all of this. But let me ask you one final question about our cooperation, which is that we, we have um, governments that have to deal with one another. We've had our ups and downs. Uh, I think AMLO will, will test uh, those relationships in important ways. But if you could give uh, the President of the United States, the Prime Minister of Canada, and the President of Mexico uh, one thing to do so that 30 years from now we had fully realized the potential of the North American energy platform, what would you say? Uh, we know that politicians have kind of limited attention span. So you only get to say one thing. Uh, Peter? I, I would say a North American um, emissions reduction standard. I, th I think if we came up with one here in North America, I mean, we can, that doesn't negate our obligations internationally, but to aim for something here in North America um, and, and how we coordinate better our grid. And we're not talking about marijuana here because that would be another contentious That's issue. a different matter, yes. Yeah. Different, different summit, yes. Mm. <laughs> mm. Well, I, I would say uh, we, we have a, a tax to do. In my opinion, the first component of the answer will be increase the efficiency and the effectiveness of our actual or present grid. Incorporating all these fabulous technologies that we are already on place, 4.0 for energy sector means many, many, many things. In my opinion, that is the first 
task that we have to do. A smart grid, distributed network, a storage energy solutions. We have many, many, many projects and things to do in that respect. And the second one, I totally agree with Pat, that, that we need to take care about the environment and comply the, the obligations that we have in, the, in front of the humankind. Thank you very much. And if you'll join me in uh, thanking our guests for their really very powerful insights. Thank you. Thank you.